Okay, so parametric equations. Let's start with what we've got that we're used to. We've got an, the Cartesian plane, and we've got an x-axis and a y-axis, and we've got the usual numbering on these axes. So, the Cartesian plane, named after Rendecart, or, I mean, my French pronunciation is no doubt very bad, but the sort of legend has it that um, Descartes came up with the Cartesian plane while he was um, confined to his bed with some kind of sickness, and he was trying to keep himself occupied, and there was a fly on the ceiling, and he asked himself, well, if I wanted to numerically keep track of this fly's position, how could I do that? And I mean, what he came up with was put one corner of the room, one corner of the ceiling here, and track the fly's distance along each wall. And those two numbers together can be used to, well, to, um, identify the fly's location. What that story, or what, or what is missing from this, I mean, you talk about a fly crawling along the ceiling. So, you have a fly that is in motion, that is not stationary. So, as time passes, the fly moves. <laughs> so, it makes sense to ask about the fly's location, but it also makes sense to ask questions about time. You know, what is the fly's location after two seconds? We could ask something like that. So we're bringing now, we're bringing a third sort of parameter or a third factor into the problem. We already had an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. Now we want to ask about a third parameter, time. And that is the central idea behind parametric coordinates and parametric equations. And the basic idea of how we're going to do this is not hard. We're going to think of having essentially two functions. So, we've got, as the fly moves, as this fly crawls around, its x-coordinate and its y-coordinate both change. So, at time zero, the fly was here. 
at time two, let's say, the fly is there. So it certainly, oof, sorry, I am dying here. I don't handle heat well. We'll see if that gets too annoying or distracting. Ooh, the wind does whistle right in, doesn't it? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll open a window that isn't like directly in a student's face. This open. Sorry to to be sort of taking a pause, but I am just super uncomfortable. Hopefully that starts to help. Anyway, so as time passes, the x coordinate changes and the y coordinate changes. So it makes sense to think of the x and the y coordinate as both being functions of time. And that's par a parametric equation. And it's called a parametric equation because this t is called a parameter. We've got x and we've got y, and then we've got a parameter. So, something like x equals t squared, y equals the square root of t. And and like 99 times out of 100, I mean, we, t, using t is very standard. 99 times out of 100, t is time. It could be something else, but um, it's most commonly time. And we usually look at time on some interval. Like, let's look at time from zero to five, let's say. And I'm, and you know, I've always been a big proponent of, uh, of technology. We can ask what happens at various moments. Like, we can ask what happens when t is zero. And that's simply a matter of taking t equals zero and plugging it into these equations. When t is zero, x is zero. And y is zero. <clears throat> so we start there, and then time passes and we move. And if we want to know about some specific point, we just take that number and plug it into equations. Where are we after one time unit? Let's say one second for simplicity. Well, x is one and y is one. So here's one, one at t equals one, where here. 
and uh, at t equals 5, well, at t equals 5, x, let me write this all down. At t equals 5, x is 5 squared or 25. Y is the square root of 5, which is, I don't know, 2 point something. It's between 2 and 3. Uh, so let's see if I gave myself enough space. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I definitely didn't. We're somewhere off the whiteboard when t equals 5. Now, I mentioned technology. I mean, there are tricks you can do to try to create, to try to sort of generate the curve. And I'll show you that. I mean, there's really one trick, which I'll show to you in a moment. But I mentioned technology, and I mentioned being a fan. Let's see if technology can generate this curve for us. x equals t squared. y equals, there's a, there's a thing you can press down here, by the way, to create these symbols. But if you just type SQRT, that will also do it. Hmm. Let's see. We're being a little okay. Just most is not cooperating, but I can make Desmos do what I actually want it to do. And I can make it do what I want it to do. You know, you can enter ordered pairs into Desmos. I can enter an ordered pair, and I can say I want the x to be t squared. And I want the y to be the square root of t. And if I do that, Desmos will generate the curve for me. It does want to know where t is starting and where t is ending. I said t could start at 0 and end at 5. Now, zooming out, then zooming back in, here's the curve that we get from t squared comma the square root of t. Uh, Desmos is being a little titchier about this than I'd like. Maybe there's a way to do it that Desmos will like better. Um, in particular, what I like about Desmos is that I can just click a curve and then scroll around it and see what's happening. Desmos is not letting me do that here. When I click this curve, it just drags the screen around, which is a little unfortunate. But we can see a picture of the curve. Notice, though, what is Desmos doing? I should be able to create... This is so irritating. Maybe if I use something other than T. There. If I create... If I use C 
let's say I can create a slider and now I can this is a little chaotic because I wasn't expecting Desmos to be so weird about it. But we'll create the curve using T. And then we can create a slider and we can see what happens if I hope everyone can see the dot here. We start at zero, zero, and then as time passes, we move up the curve in that direction. And however you do it, whether you use Desmos like I'm doing, or whether you mess around pen and paper, you have to get some idea, you have to have some knowledge of what's happening as time is passing. Because the curve itself, I mean, is only part of the story, right? Like maybe at time zero, we start here, and then as time passes, we bounce up and down along the curve or something. And I mean, that's not happening, but it could happen. So you need to figure out what happens as time passes. And for me, again, that's usually just, okay, let's look at a picture and let's see. So, if I wanted to look at something more complicated, maybe x is t squared plus the sine of t, and y is 1 minus the cosine of t. And t maybe goes from 0 to 50. So let's mess around with this axis um, manually. Why does not we need to be going down to negative 85. Maybe y goes from negative 10 to positive 10. And Desmos again just creates the picture for us. And again, I mean, we need to know what's happening as time is passing. I mean, where do we start on this curve? Where do we end up? And you can do this manually. I mean, we start at t equals zero. So t equals zero is zero squared plus the sine of zero is zero. 1 minus the cosine of 0 is 0. So we're starting at the origin. And then as time passes, presumably we're moving left to right. But again, we can make Desmos graph a particular point for us. And we can add, click add a slider, and we can say that we want to start at zero and end at 50, just like we do up here. And then we can scroll, and we can see what happens as time passes. And I guess pretty much what you'd expect as time passes, we travel along the curve from left to right. So, 
So here is, uh, this is, uh, that in time go from zero to fifty is ambitious here. Let's that time go from zero to ten. But let's also mess around with Desmos so that we can see this picture better. Let's that Y be just a little bigger. And X should be significantly smaller. Negative 1.5. Positive 1.5, maybe. So we get this picture, and it's very hard to make sense of. And here's where having a slider would really pay off, because we start at zero, presumably. But do we go, I mean, we could go along the curve this way, come back then go down, come this way, go back. Or maybe this is a spiral. Maybe we're following the curve in this direction. It's really hard to see this and know. But if, I feel there must be a better way to do this, but I don't know what it is, if there is. If we use something other than T, let's say C, and we want to go from 0 to 10 now. Then we see we start here, and we are spiraling counterclockwise. And if we let T be bigger, maybe T can go up to 30. Scroll out so we can see more of this then mess around with our viewing window. Why does it need to be bigger than 2.5, let's say? So this is quite the shape we've developed, but it's easy to see what happens over time using technology. We just look at this point. We go up, we go down, we go up, we go down. So we're in these kind of not quite circles. We're going around and around in the counterclockwise direction as time passes. If you didn't want to use, I'm going to show this to you, I feel, out of tradition more than anything else at this point. It's very silly to pretend that we're likely to be doing calculus without having access to technology in this year, 2023. But if you were trying to figure out the shape of a parametric curve, and you didn't just want to graph the thing for whatever reason, We could try to eliminate the parameter. And eliminating the parameter, well, first of all, let's get the bad news out of the way. 
it doesn't always work. I'm not even sure that I'd go so far as to say it usually works. It requires us to have some pretty simple functions for eliminating the parameter to work. The trick of eliminating the parameter might be basically familiar to you if you ever learned to solve two by two systems of equations. So, if you haven't, that's fine, and you don't need, I mean, you don't need to learn it now. But a trick we learned for assuming that you did learn it, for solving a system like this, is to take one of the equations, let's say the first one, and solve for one of the variables. Say y equals 2 minus x. And then you take that and you plug it into the other equation. So 2x minus 3 times 2 minus x equals 1. And once you've done this, you can solve for x. So 2x minus 6 plus 3x equals 1. Doing the algebra, 5x equals 7. x equals seven-fifths. And then once you know that x is seven-fifths, you can solve for y. But, I mean, I don't actually care about this system of equations. I just wanted to remind my, ourselves of the method. Solve for one of the variables. Plug it into the other equation. If you have a sufficiently simple system of parametric equations, um, I've dropped the function notation, which we very often do. So instead of x of t and y of t, I just write x and y. Um, but the strategy we can use here, again, assuming these are sufficiently simple, is basically the same as the strategy we used here. Take whichever of these equations is simplest. I think x in this case. And solve for t. x is 2t minus 1. x plus 1 equals 2t. x plus 1 over 2 equals t. And once we've solved for t, we take this and we plug it into our other equation. And we get y equals x plus 1 over 2 squared. 
and we've eliminated the parameter. And this, remember that our parameter is t. We had x in terms of t, and we had y in terms of t. Now we have x and y in terms of each other. We have a traditional equation. And t in, in this equation here is nowhere to be found. We've eliminated it. So the weaknesses of eliminating the parameter, well, First of all, we kind of have to know what the new equation looks like, right? Because, I mean, we could go to Desmos and we could make Desmos graph that parametric system. So the only point to doing this would be if you didn't want to use technology for some reason. So if you do all of this and you wind up with something that you can't graph in your head and then you have to go to Desmos anyway to figure out what this thing looks like, well, what, what was the point of that? Um, I think... I mean, I don't know if this is um, obvious to you. This is the kind of thing that you just sort of pick up when you teach algebra for like 10 years straight. This is a shift. This is a parabola that's been shifted to the left. So I do know basically what this curve looks like. It looks basically like this. But the other sort of weakness or the other downside of this, or let, let's take a less pessimistic framing, the other issue that needs to be resolved if we do this is that we have completely lost the time parameter. So let's say we have some specific time values that we're interested in. We start at time zero and we end at time three. Now, in terms of this graph, where do we start? Where do we end? What's happening? Now, well, we're not going to do anything fancy here. If we start at time zero, then where do we start? We plug zero into these equations, and we get the point negative one, zero. So we start there. And do we go left? Do we go right? Do we go in some weird pattern back and forth? Well, let's think this through. Um, X and Y are always increasing. I mean, as T increase, as T gets bigger, 2T minus 1 gets bigger. And as T gets bigger, t squared gets bigger. So as time passes, both x and y get bigger. So we must be going along the curve in that direction. If we went along the curve in the other direction, 
x would be getting smaller as time passes. And that isn't what we see. Any questions so far? I know I, I feel like I used to be better about that. Maybe now that the semester is closing, I've started to ramble. And there's, let's look, there's a very famous example of eliminating the parameter, which I suppose we ought to do. And that's when one of these coordinates is the sine and the other coordinate is the cosine. And eliminating the parameter here is a trick. This isn't something I would expect you to come up with unprompted. If I just put this on the board and paused the recording and had you try to do this, you'd probably end up with something like y equals the cosine of the arc sine of t, and then we would have no idea what that looked like, so it wouldn't be very helpful. The, the trick here is that if x is the sine and y is the cosine, then x squared plus y squared is the sine squared plus the cosine squared. And the Pythagorean identity says that the sine squared plus the cosine squared is 1. So cutting out that middle term, x squared plus y squared equals 1. And again, if you don't remember what that graph looks like, Eliminating the parameter is a little pointless, but I'll remind you if that's the case. This is a circle radius of 1 centered at the origin. Centered at 0, comma, 0. And let's put time between zero and two pi. And let's take a look at this. I mean, I've told you what the curve looks like. Okay, it's looking all weird because our, you see, this is 0 to negative 10, this is 0 to 1. If we default our viewing windows, it will lo stop looking like some squashed thing. And again, the point that always needs to be driven home is that even if you know what the curve looks like in the rectangular plane, that's only half of the battle, or it's only part of the information you really want. I mean, where do we start on this circle? It looks like we could start anywhere. Are we going clockwise or counterclockwise or some combination? Are we, I mean, we obviate wherever we start, we trace a full path. I mean, we go 
all the way around the circle, but maybe we go around the circle three times or two and a half times. Just having this picture here is not super useful. And again, this is where, I mean, we need this information. Probably the easiest way to get it done, Desmos, unless, again, there's some easy Desmos trick I'm just not, not uh, aware of. We can create this slider. We can tell Desmos we want to start at zero and we want to end at 2 pi. Uh, just for reference, I do this so quickly. Um, pi is down here if you're using, if like you're on a phone or something and it's not convenient to be typing things on the calculator, but if you just spell out pi, Desmos will create that symbol for you. So at zero, we are here. So we start up at the top of the circle. We're going clockwise as time passes. And we wind up back where we started, having made one full revolution. And if we now compare this, x equals the cosine of 2t. Y equals the sine of 2t. T is going between 0 and 2 pi. Now, x squared plus y squared is still the cosine squared plus the sine squared. And even with those two t's there, that's still equal to one. So we've changed x and we've changed y, but we haven't changed the shape of this curve. When we eliminate the parameter, we still get a circle with a radius of 1 and a center at the origin. So what have we changed? If we haven't changed the shape of the curve, well, we've changed all of the other stuff that isn't the shape of the curve. Things like, where does we start at time zero? Where do we wind up at two pi? How fast are we moving? All the questions like that. Let's now look at the cosine of 2t, comma, the sine of 2t, where t is going from 0 to 2 pi. So, same shape we had before. It's still a circle at the origin. We'll create the cosine of 2c, comma, the sine of 2c. 
right. And it, uh, Desmos is recognizing that we already defined C up here. So we're starting somewhere else. Previously, we were with this uh, sine, comma, cosine, we were starting up here. Now at zero, we're starting over here. And we've changed our direction. We're going counterclockwise now. And we've also changed our speed between zero and two pi seconds, you see we went around the circle. Now we're going around the circle again. So we're going twice as fast as we were before. And that's our, that's our parametric equations crash course. And what you'll notice is that we didn't do any calculus today. This was, I mean, if you took pre-calculus, you probably learned this there. We'll start talking about derivatives and calculus material tomorrow. I will see you then. What section is the uh, test on? The test is going to be on chapter 10. The sections that we covered of that. So no uh, no parametrics on the test. I know.